Hello everybody, I'm here with Professor Kenneth Gargan, a professor at Wardmore College, professor in psychology, um, founder of the Taos Institute and one of the most important fathers of the social constructionism. Hello, uh, Professor Gergen. Hey, nice to be here, Flavio. Nice to see you. Thank you very much for this interview. I think it will be very interesting to talk about uh, brief therapy and uh, social constructionism. Um, are you ready? Yes, ready. Okay. I've been ready for about 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> So, um, I think that asking something like, uh, can you talk about what is social constructionism is something very big, a very big question, but if you can give us um, just an idea about social constructionism, just to have an idea of what it is, how it works, why it's so important, it would be perfect. Uh, all right, um, you have several hours. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let me, uh, we call them uh, elevator talks. How much you can say going up in an elevator? In 30 before. seconds, yeah. <laughs> so, so social construction is in 30 seconds. I think this is a very, a very cool challenge. <laughs> all right, let me at least give you three or four minutes. <laughs> Originally, for me and a number of other people, there were a number of dialogues that were taking place, oh, in the 70s and 80s, 90s of last century. Um, and these were dialogues about the nature of truth and objectivity and research and um, a science and, and the enlightenment. And uh, from these dialogues, there was a beginning of a major questioning of what we call positivism or empiricism, uh, sort of the dominant view of science that had been developing over uh, the century preceding. And it was a kind of, um, it had been a very productive view in the natural sciences, but it, it had become problematic in the social sciences. And in that period of the 70s, 80s and 90s, there were enormous amount of, of, of set of ideas coming together which I'm calling together a social constructionist. Now that's not the, I'm not the only one to use that term. And I use it here in a very broad sense, but they were ideas that said, look, whatever we believe about science is not philosophically grounded. It's not as if there were propositions, which simply logics, which simply had to be the case. And that was, had been what, or what's called foundationalism. There's no foundation for that, for that view of science. Rather, and this is the constructionist piece, whatever we call science is a, is a, is a cultural, con, a cultural um, a venture. That is, it's, it's, it depends on assumptions, values, ideas, meta theory, metaphysics <clears throat> that are culturally embedded. Now, what that meant was that it undermined the idea of a fixed view of knowledge, which science had a particular hold on and begin to again to offer another view, again, this cultural one, which said where traditional science said here is the object of study. Let us locate and find out about it. The constructionist dialogues were saying, we approach whatever this is with a whole set of assumptions and, it, and languages that we share and whatever, however we study it is going to reflect that. Hmm. Now, it, this is a major difference. One says we start with the object and try to study it for what it is. The other says, we start from culture and ask questions about this from that cultural standpoint. Okay. Or okay. to put it another way, there's nothing about the world that makes or demands any particular way of looking at it. Or to put it another way, 
I can approach this from multiple perspectives. Yeah. Uh, I can approach it uh, as a art designer, as a ceramicist, uh, as someone who is tasting an espresso that I poured just for myself for this interview. Um, I could, uh, I can ask a lot of questions from different perspectives. Right? Yeah. But if I have no perspective, there's nothing I can ask about that. Of course. And that also means that whatever we say about this is going to reflect not only a perspective, but values. So if I reproach this as an art historian, I'm going to value something about its place in art history and the value of art. If I come at it looking at a ceramicist, I'm going to value, is this a good ceramic object? If I'm a, coming at it uh, as us in conversation, I'm going to ask, uh, is this a good espresso? <laughs> and um, I will look at a taste. But what I'm trying to say is that we, we construct the world, interpret it from standpoints, from perspectives, from value positions. And we can come at it in multiple perspectives, in multiple ways, having to ask, what is the value of those perspectives? And who is it valuable for? Hmm. As, who cares about it for what purpose? Now, let me give you an example, but you know, tie it back pretty soon to therapy. Yeah. If I look at people who are having difficulties of one way or another, let's say they're hearing voices. I can diagnose that person as schizophrenic and I can have all sorts of other diagnostic categories. We do 300 and some. That person speaking multiple voices does we diagnosis creates that person as mentally ill. Hmm. That individual is not mentally ill until I have a diagnostic categories which which define people as mentally ill. Yeah. It, there's no mental illness in the world. That's just a set of categories or constructions that we have to make sense of the world. Now, that's not unimportant because then you begin to ask who, who value, what, who benefits from those constructions? Do people benefit by being called schizophrenic? Could they be called something else that would not be make them look like they're ill? Hmm. Um, we are we from diagnostic categories. We create the world of mental illness, which then becomes something that the drug companies benefit from. And suddenly, you have drugs tied to each illness. And you have a you have a, a, a commercial machine going now. Yeah. Because you mental health. Here are the diagnostic categories. Here is what you need from the from the shelf of of, of, of international pharmaceutical companies. So in the last twenty years, pharmaceuticals no thirty years they become billion dollar industries billion dollar industries not because people really are mentally ill but because that way of defining them pays off yeah now then you ask yourself again does it help the people who are mentally ill well that's a question uh, right now in the united states one in six people is on some kind of pharmacolo pharmacological treatment or will be and, and 50 years ago there weren't any now it's one in six are on drugs hmm. is that really a benefit to society and so if now we really have but everybody you know treated now it's really good we're got a yeah. nirvana because everybody's treated yeah well i also worked with um for a while with the group uh, hearing voices movement i don't know if you know that group but yeah. it's an international movement which says look 
Hearing voices is not mentally ill, it's just another way of being in the world. And it doesn't require drugs to treat it. It's like I have a problem, for example, with tinnitus. It means I can't hear very well because I have a hum in my ear. Yeah. Well, you don't treat it as mentally ill. You treat it as something, and I have to make a hearing aid, to, you know, to treat that. In the same way, people who hear voices say, well, look, you can do things about that. You can talk back to the voices. You yeah. can say, hey, I don't want to do that. Or what made you think so smart? Or, uh, or you can find ways to um, meditate or do music. I mean, there are a lot of ways of doing about 36 ways of responding to voices that are not pharmacological, that don't require psychiatry, that don't require that label of mental illness. So there's just an example. Yeah. Got the categories, okay, but who they are psychiatrists are good for psychiatrists, they're good for mental for the pharmaceutical companies, but are they good for people? That's an open question. This seems to me a very big and very disruptive in a way because um, thinking in the way social constructionism thinks is, um, I would just say, it's, it's not a it's not the old stable way to see things you know um, in, in the whole stable ways we can say taking uh, your example okay this is a glass this is an object this is this and this is this forever and for everyone yeah. and uh, in your beautiful books uh, we're lucky we're lucky to have this book in uh, uh, italian construction yeah. social construction and uh, therapeutic practice uh, translated by Diego Romaioli, who is a uh, your, yeah, very uh, good friend of mine and lovely yeah, guy. It's a very lovely guy. Uh, I can see that, and um, and it's it's interesting because in a way, uh, when I was looking, when I was reading this book, I I, I was saying something like, oh, why, wow, uh, this is so big, so um, mind blowing in a way, you know. Um, in another way, I can see the possibilities that you give to yourself as a therapist and to your clients. But my question is, um, you talk a, um, a little about influences of social constructionism on psychotherapy. Uh, do you have any suggestion about in the social constructionist pr perspective about what do you need to help the people to change, to solve their problem, to, to have benefit from, from therapy? How change the practical work of the psychotherapist? Yeah. yeah. The way I have begun to think about this from early on, initially, when that set of ideas was developing, what it did was to form a, a kind of critique of all the therapies that existed till, till then, <laughs> in the sense of, let's say, Freudian therapy, Rogerian, and there were you know, numerous other therapies who were all com competing to find out which one was the, the right one. Cognitive behavior, another one. Um, as if there was like treatments for some kind of disease. And each therapy depended on assumptions, like psychoanalysis depended on an, an idea of repression and unconscious. Cognitive behavioral depended on a notion of cognitive, idea, cognitive construals or ideas of a cognitive system. Uh, Rogerian depended on uh, unconditional positive regard. Each one had what you might say a foundational assumption. What constructionism did is to say, look, there are no foundations. 
these are just ideas. Yeah. And to fight about which one is the right one, it, that's not right. That's not, it's a, there isn't any right one. <laughs> They're all ideas. And each of them has values and certain people for whom they might be useful. But they're not u useful universally, and they carry I values that not everyone would agree to. Yeah. To give you an example, a lot of feminist critique, which came out of constructionist ideas, feminist critique of psychoanalysis. Because it said, if you're a woman and you go to a psychoanalyst, you're in a power relationship where the analyst knows everything, you know nothing. Yeah. And eventually that analyst will help you to discover what he already knows. Yeah. So as a feminist critique, it was saying, look, you know, it's why do we have to believe that? What? Because we don't like the power relationship. And there are other critiques of uh, Carl Rogers and, and uh, his therapy, which, which was Christianity in another form. It was saying, if you love, everything will grow and be proper. So Carl Rogers was like Christ. Uh, yeah. I, I love you unconditionally. It was carrying values <clears throat> of a particular kind. Now, what that did was to say, look, you do not have to subscribe to any of those therapies. They are all possibilities they, we don't have to fight about which was the best because there, there is no best in a changing world. They each have certain things they can do and don't do. Now that was the beginning because it just gave you freedom. It was like, wow. So I don't have to have any of those therapies necessarily. So it was like liberation from from foundationalism. Now that, that's the first step. The second step, which is very related to what you do, is, is to say, all right, if those are social constructions, what if we looked at therapy as a kind of a social process of social construction? In other words, it's taking that set of ideas and say, why don't we use them in the therapeutic process? The obvious case from this, narrative therapy. It was a child of social constructionist ideas. Look, what we're doing is telling a story about our lives. And some stories are really hurtful for us. Others help us. So therapy becomes then a matter of trying to find a different story. You know, it's like restoring the, 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 the problem a person has is the way they're telling about the problem. Yeah. The problem is the problem. That is the way you tell yourself, I'm a failure. I can't do this. I can't do that. No one loves me. I'm unlovable. I have weird ideas. Those I, that narrative is already your problem. So then therapy becomes a whole re-narration. Now, brief therapy is, inherits that same set of assumptions. De Chaser is basically a constructionist. It says, look, let's not talk about the problem so much, but we can talk about the problem infinitely for years. And, and because we talk about the problem, the problem only becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. The more you talk about it, the more real it becomes. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about where do you want to, I'm, I'm rephrasing, where do you want to go? What would it be like if you woke up five years from now? It's like, it's a different way of talking about yourself and, and, and the world. Yeah. So if you don't try to solve the problem, if that's a construction, but you talk about where you want to go and what your, how you can get there, what your, what strengths you have. Yeah. 
of what it would be like, you open up a whole different way of, of treatment, which of course you know better than me, says, look, you can, people can come in and, and it doesn't take that long. It doesn't take five years of psychoanalysis. It takes three months of talking about in a different way. So those are just two examples. And there are a lot of others. Reflecting teams came out of that same idea. Let's, let's not have one way of looking at it. Let's multiply the ways of seeing things with different voices. This is Tom Anderson. Uh, Harleen Anderson's um, uh, postmodern therapy where you, you simply listen and try to bring the person out so that slowly the story changes. Um, not so much. It's very interesting because, um, um, you know, Kelly's personal, Kelly's theory, which is very sort of constructionist, mm -hmm. not quite, not quite constructionist. It, it's still a cognitive therapy. Yeah. So, but this is, this is, but, but what I'm telling you about grief therapy, narrative therapy, and that's different. It's, they're just saying, look, change the conversation. Yeah. And you change the world for the person. Change the way we're talking. What we're talking about, change the content, change the way we're relating, and you can change, bring about change. It's like you give and social constructionists gave um, many different point of view to the to the person and to the therapist. Uh, you can see the world and you can see yourself and you can talk about yourself in several different ways. You don't have a mental heal. You don't um, you don't have this or that you can right. be right. Uh, whatever you you want we, we can say or uh, whatever you want to construct or you are able to construct the therapist is like someone that help you to construct in the way that you prefer or in that direction yeah um, and and here you you give us um, um, an answer about about that um, because here, because here there is an, an interesting the, the other phase of the of the coin. Um, always in this book, you talk about um, mental health has oppression. Um, I remember in an interview of Michael Hoyt with Steve DeShazer and John Wickland. Yeah. I think John Wickland says we um, we stopped to be a mental health professional and we start to be um, mental disease professional so yeah. what do you mean uh, can you give us some example uh, you just say something but can you explore more the way in which um, the mental health can be an oppression uh, with the client and in the society. Yeah. Um, there's a way in which that story I was telling about psychiatry and diagnostics yeah. and pharmaceuticals is that story. Yeah. That is, once you assume that whatever is wrong, whatever problems a person has are because they, as an individual, are unhealthy. That kind of medical model. We create label, labels, so we create stories. And label them as unhealthy, and you have this problem, and this problem, yeah. and this problem, and it's inside your head. Yeah. <laughs> you are already at a deficit. I mean, you're already labeled as an, as a, some, an outsider, somebody who's not quite good, who's not quite right. So already you're kind of in a, in a bad position, you're badly located. Um, Th there was not uh, um, ADHD uh, 80 years ago, 
50. ADHD is a wonderful example. Yeah. There's a case where you're right. There was no ADHD. Why do we have that? I mean, we had children who were very active. We always had that. That doesn't make them ill. And the, but because we've got school systems, which demand high, high grades, but now it becomes more and more important that everybody make high grades, pass the test. Now people who don't pass the test must have a mental problem. They're not paying attention and that must be a mental problem. Now is that what's interesting is that the, the child who's being diagnosed, they've had no problem. They're, they're perfectly fine about life that nobody told them they were, you know, they don't come in. Oh God, I'm so, so I'm having such, um, a bad time. I can't stand myself. They're not complaining. They're just active. But then the teacher says, well, oh, they're not paying attention. They and parents say, look, they're not making good grades. Uh, it must be the child. Then you get a psychiatrist to diagnose, diagnose the child. Yeah. And that child is a victim of a school system, a, a grading system, parental ambition and psychiatry. And he, and that child had no, no choice. That child will end up eight years later, still taking a drug because there's no way to know if he, when he's cured. Yeah. <laughs> there's no, you know, the, we don't have very many ways to tell when somebody, when they're, they're finished with illness. <laughs> not, not like, you know, you, well, I'm glad to see you're not ADHD anymore. Or, you know, like, well, you have no, no indicators. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I have a, a, a girl we, we raised in our family who was, um, she was a big, uh, her mother committed suicide and her father left her. So she was in bad shape. Um, and we just let her live with us and tried to help her as best we could. And they put her on an anti-anxiety, anti-depression. 20 years later, she's still on an antidepressant and she wants to have children, but because life has become, she knows life only through an antidepressant. She couldn't get off. Mm. It was like dislocating. So that's where it becomes oppressive. Yeah. And it becomes oppressive when that's the only, the only way we have of treating people the only way we have of helping them is when you have these assumptions, you lock it into insurance systems, you lock it into big advertising and the mental health programs in the country, international mental health week. I mean, all this is setting people up to say, if I have something wrong with me, I must be mentally ill or something. I must have a problem. You know, Perhaps it's a school that has a problem, for example, with the kid. Yeah. Perhaps it's a, you're depressed at work. Maybe it's the way work, work life functions. It is depressing. There was a saying in, in Poland once a long time ago that if, if you're not depressed, you don't see the world correctly. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I really would like to talk about this topic for many hours. Uh, you, you're aware of me, you're aware of me. Um, I have to do a, a last question. Um, it's very, as, as I said before, it's very disruptive. So, it's very difficult, it seems to me, to many people, to many professionals to see things in this way, you know. Um, I think me too, uh, for a long time, uh, sometimes, um, sometimes uh, just now actually, uh, but many professionals say, you know, um, no, this is not true, I have data, I have uh, um, studies about uh, effectiveness, efficiency, and I can prove that this therapy is better from this other therapy. 
even if now we have many studies that says to us that um, all the therapies seem uh, the same about efficacy uh, maybe they not are the same about uh, um, the the uh, the duration of therapy but this is another story so um i think that's a reason is that uh, how to say it's 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 more easy and it's more common to think in uh, not social construction in ways to say this is a glass and it's a glass for everyone and for everywhere and forever and uh, even if i can't say maybe you can say it better that in, in in the present we are living there are some seeds that can that we can embrace social construction is perspective but what i want to ask is what do you see in the present and in the future of social constructionism and of psychotherapy with social constructionism let me say a little bit about therapy about social construction and then go back to therapy in particular I think for a lot of us who got into these ideas a number of years ago, we have begun to turn to the to a way of looking at life in terms of relational process. Yeah. Um, all right. Now that's not a small thing because it 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 shifts the ground from the from the talking. That is, let me try to be clear. I think with that first wave of social construction, when it came into therapy, it said, if you change the way of talking, okay, what you talk about how you talk about it, where you focus, change the narrative, change the story, was very language oriented. No. That is, we change the language. Yeah. We change the person. I think if you go into this relational perspective that I think a lot of us have, are going, you, you realize that, that changing the language is, you don't change it permanently, it's continuously moving. Mm -hmm. you change a narrative at one point, well, it's still the person's in process, in dialogue. You change the way they think about the future or the way they are proposing to go on, that can change in a moment. So you can't, you can't freeze the therapeutic outcome because it's too language based. Let's say, what if we tried to talk about the relational process that one steps out of the office and into the moment that person leaves your office and goes home? or goes in back into a bad family situation or complex emotional life, a bad workplace, all those things, they step in the process. So for me, and I, what I see as a future here is to try to pay more attention to how to help people to engage in that process in those set of relationships. Hmm. Um, just a brief example, for example, yeah. I, what if I, what if I came away from a narrative therapy and I realized, um, that it's, that it's not, um, that people don't like me, which I thought it's that, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't seek love from people. I, I should go out and, and, ha and have a loving relationship. I don't try. That is, I came in thinking nobody loves me. I'm changing the story. No, people don't dislike you. What you are this is a new story. You're not trying to generate loving relationships. Okay. Okay. Now here's the problem. How do I generate a loving relationship? Hmm. How to do that? What do I say? What do I do? How do I look? What words do I use? Where do, what clothes do I wear? And oh, 
that's a how to engage in a social process. Yeah. It's a it's an action. It's a set of actions, and words are some of those actions, but much more complicated than just having words. It's a way how to do complex social life. How to how to relate to a boss who really is. Tyrannical. Mm-hmm. How to relate to a spouse who seems to be criticizing you all the time? How to relate to a son who is having drug issues? It's that how to engage in the social process, and that to me is, to me, the future. Because we've got a really complex. Cultural changes that are happening all the time. You do, we do. Partly, digital world we're in. It's continuously moving. Values, ways of life,、uh, what people do, what they care about, under continuous change. How do you, how do you survive? How do you thrive in that multiplicity?、Yeah. That that to me is the, the question I continuously raise now. How do I do that? How do you do it? Can you help me to do it better? I mean, for example, you as a therapist are trained in relationship, and you read about it. You watch videos. You talk to people. People have watched you. You've observed. You are well trained to have those special relationships. Yeah. What if we help other people to be able to have complex relationships?、Um, anyway, I, so I'm trying to move then from a changing simply the language we come away with to looking at therapy as a way of enabling people to engage in the process of relating itself. It sounds. Big, and it sounds yeah yeah, but、uh, challenging in a good way. I mean,、um, I see what narrative therapy are doing. I I practice solution focus、uh, therapy and other kind of therapies that um, um, puts their hands in social construction、uh, theories, social construction values, and I think. That's the future. I think that's、uh, something that must be teaching, teaching,、uh, teacher in all the、um, psychology faculty,、um, and I hope it will be、uh, in this way in everyone and soon,、uh, even in Italy. Yeah. Yeah. So.、Um, anyway.、Um, yeah. yeah. I, but it's exciting to think, you know. It's like、uh, therapy to me is a is a critical、um, or really central uh, uh, profession、yeah. because it's one of those few professions that really plays a role in social life,、yeah. creating a cult. And so, continuously reflecting on therapy, what that's like and what it does, enormously important. Yeah, and, and not to not to come down on one school. This is the way it's going to be, and this is the way it always must be. That that's killing.、Uh, keep reflection, and, which is what you're doing with your podcast. Yeah, <laughs> I totally agree. I think this is the longest interview I had, and it's not long enough to me.、Um, I hope to see you soon in、uh, Italy or everywhere.、And、yeah, that would be nice. Thank you, Professor Gergen. Up in a, a cooler month. Oh yeah, I hope it's so. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Gergen, and have a nice day. Yeah, Fabio. Good luck to you. Thank you. You too. Bye.